Joining me now, fresh from his triumph at the Monk debate on anti-Zionism, is the great Douglas Murray, author of best-selling works, including his latest, The War on the West. Uh, we'll get to the debate shortly, Douglas, on whether anti-Zionism is synonymous with anti-Semitism. But first, let's start in the UK with the latest YouGov poll showing Labor on course for the biggest landslide in 100 years. The Times reports Labor is on track to win the biggest majority of any party in a century, with the Tories hemorrhaging support to Nigel Farage's reform and the Liberal Democrats. Uh, one can understand why the British public is thoroughly sick of the Tories and their broken promises, but... What sort of UK are we going to see under Labor, which is hardly a moderate or centrist party nowadays? Well, it's a very interesting question. The answer is really nobody knows, Rita, because the Labour Party, the leadership, has been fantastically good in uh, recent months of not telling us really anything that it's planning to do. It's doing the usual thing of saying you know, they're going to protect the NHS and pour more money into it. They're going to make schools even better than they are. Uh, they're going to raise everyone's living standards and, and, and all the usual things. And uh, as I always say, these things are pointless to say unless anyone says the opposite. Nobody says that we would like to lower living standards. Nobody says we'd like to make education worse. This is the kind of pabulum we all have to tolerate in election season. But the really interesting thing is, of course, is that the Labour Party has been wise enough not to tell us how it's going to pay for any of this. And that's because there's really only one way they will be able to pay for it, which is to raise taxes. And they know that you cannot say in your manifesto, that's why we're going to have to raise taxes. So all they're doing is waiting until they are in office and then we'll discover what they really intend to do. It's, it's a pretty shocking situation, actually. I mean, the Tories only have themselves to blame, as you say, uh, but they're hemorrhaging votes in every direction. Some Conservative voters will be voting for the you know, more moderate than Jeremy Corbyn Labour Party. Others will be staying at home. Others will be voting for the Liberal Democrats because they can always sponge votes off other people because they're even more of a blur as a party than Labour is trying to be. And, of course, they're losing votes to Nigel Farage's reform. It's an absolute cluster mm. for the Conservatives. And a couple of polls this week show them uh, uh, actually getting behind Nigel Farage's reform party in the polls. Mm. And as, as you say, I mean, not only a wipeout for the Conservative Party, but such a historic uh, um, majority for any party, let alone the Labour Party, that, that basically Keir Starmer will be able to do whatever he wants in the next five years. Well, Labour from the uh, top down over the recent years have embraced uh, just about every neo-Marxist folly from uh, taking a knee for BLM, remember that, to uh, pushing the most extremes of trans activism. But Keir Starmer has yeah. suddenly discovered the uh, startling news that men have a penis and women have a vagina. It is a departure from what he has said in the recent past. Indeed, he is performing quite a few backflips in this area. Let's have a look. A woman can have a penis. <laughs> Nick, I'm not... I don't think we can conduct this debate with, you know... Trans rights are human rights, and I support the right to self-identification. I think we need to uh, respect the right to self-identify. And we're committed to updating the GRA to introduce self-declaration for trans people. We don't think that um, self-identification is the right way forward. Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? Well, it is uh, something that uh, shouldn't be said. It is not right. Is it right or is it wrong for Rosie Duffield to say only women have a cervix? Well, look, biologically, she, of course, is right. right. It's extraordinary, Douglas, that a man who is in his 60s now has such a uh, fluid uh, value system. One minute something is harmful and transphobic, next minute he's happy to scream it from the rooftops. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's also quite alarming just for any man uh, to get into his 60s and discover that men have penises <laughs> uh, and uh, women don't. Uh, it makes you wonder what he's done with his life.
Um, but but no, of, of course, this is all just this. I mean, it's it's so pathetic watching him wriggle like that. Uh, he failed to stand up for his mm. very brave uh, female MP, Rosie Duffield, uh, when she simply stated biological fact. He spent a long time doing exactly what we saw him do in one of those interviews, which is, well, it might be true, but we shouldn't say it as if as if facts mm. are sort of offensive and 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 always always this dance it, it reminds me of the sort of the, the religious wars of the 14 and 1500s when people were sort of forced to say things or forced to denounce things even if they believed them and it's like that why doesn't this man if he wants to be a, a leader uh, why doesn't he just have the courage to say what everyone knows is true and say of course it doesn't need to mean doesn't mean we need to be unpleasant or mean or anything like that to anyone who believes that they're born in the wrong body. But 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 that doesn't mean that facts aren't facts. It's perfectly straightforward, and uh, it, it's very telling about mm. him because, as I've written before, the problem with it isn't isn't this issue itself only. It's that anyone who's going to be blown by a cultural wind that way, which wasn't the case merely seven or eight years ago. The next cultural wind will blow them again and again and again. And who knows which winds will blow in the next five or ten years whilst Keir Starmer is prime minister. And that's the problem, it seems. Both sides of politics, uh, the Tories as well, that there's just no conviction there. These, these politicians just look at what the latest focus groups tell them and suddenly their positions have changed. And with much of the left, though, one thing you can count on is this uh, loathing for the West, particularly their own history and sometimes their own people. And I want to have you to have a look at this uh, tweet from uh, someone who's going to be a Labor front bencher, probably Jess Phillips, mocking a guy for wearing the St George flag as a cape. Of course, England were uh, playing, uh, the football team was playing, so that's what that uh, guy was doing, supporting the team. I don't think, Douglas, you would ever do that, mock someone for having a Palestinian flag draped around their neck. But if it's uh, a British symbol, then they feel emboldened to uh, shame someone on, on social media. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is... this is. I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, Rita, you know, that w w they listen to focus groups. Would that the politicians did listen to focus groups? They don't. They listen to a few deranged yeah. harridans on their own side most of the time, screaming banshees from the culture wars online. Uh, <laughs> and the real public, the normal public, want to have nothing to do with that nonsense. You know, and the normal public believe, quite rightly, in Britain like elsewhere, that, you know, if your national team is playing, you know, you, you, that's the team you support. And your national flag... You you know, might be a flag you're able to fly and even be proud of. Uh, but as you say, Rita, we mm. live in a strange era in the West where you can be proud of everything apart from what is yours. Um, any other flag, Jess Phillips, who's, an, who's another example of us just sort of swayed by the wind. Every gust that blows takes Jess Phillips with it. She likes to present herself as this you know, working class, straight talking uh, uh, woman. She isn't. She's an absolutely typical automatum of the era who says whatever she thinks she has to say to get avoiding the banshees that are, that are, that are howling. Um, and, and yes, I mean, there's this sort of snobbery about this. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of your national flag. Um, uh, but as, as you know, mm. uh, it's, it's only in the West that we beat ourselves up like this and tolerate uh, uh, politicians who scorn the public for being proud of their country. Now, you were involved in the Monk debate in Toronto where you argued that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Uh, Two-thirds of the audience gave you an emphatic victory. And uh, let's have a look at a clip. I think we can see why you won the debate. And there is no law of war that says you're allowed to start a war and then complain when you lose it. <laughs> and... And if Mehdi cares about the Palestinian casualties, as I'm sure he does, then tell your bosses in Qatar to tell their friends in Gaza to stop the war and give back the hostages. Douglas, tell me why you believe anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. I say it, it's, it's obvious that in... 
in all of history, anti-Semitism has been a shape-shifting virus. Sometimes people hated the Jews for their race. Sometimes they hated them for their religion. In this era, people, uh, the only permissible way to hate the Jews is to hate them for having a state. And uh, as I mentioned in the debate, this absolute obsession with the single Jewish state in the world, this this way in which people who never turned out on the streets when Bashar al-Assad was killing six times the number of people who've died in every war involving Israel since 1948, when the Arab armies advanced. If you didn't come out on the streets when Bashar al-Assad killed six times that number of people in a decade, but you did turn out to attack Israel after October the 7th, you're an anti-Semite. And uh, there are many, many other examples of this. I gave examples of in Canada, in the city I was in, Toronto, uh, uh, synagogues firebombed, uh, Jewish schools shot at, mm. uh, um, a Muslim mob going through a Jewish area screaming about these Zionist rats and pigs. And uh, this is just anti-Semitism. And it's the only form of it. And as I said, this doesn't mean that everyone who is anti-Zionist knows they're an anti-Semite. Plenty of them are just incredibly ignorant and drinking from wells they don't understand. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of them, and I think Mehdi Hassan is one of them, know exactly what they're doing. And um, it was a pretty vicious evening. Uh, Natasha Hausdorff, a great uh, British barrister, uh, was on my side, and I think we convincingly won the hall. But we were against, you know, some, some mm. pretty unpleasant op opposition. And one of them I was referring to there, Mehdi Hassan of Al Jazeera, um, he presents himself as caring about the Palestinian peoples. His bosses in Doha, uh, one of the major supporters of Hamas and have the Hamas leadership living in Doha beside Al Jazeera's headquarters. And as I mentioned a bit later in the debate, you know, um, Mehdi Hassan and his uh, fellow uh, um, uh, alleged, uh, alle alleged humanitarians, they pretend they care about the Palestinian people. And really, I think they just want to beat up on the Jewish state and eradicate it. I think most of the, the anti-Zionists of this, this era, that's really what they're after. They're after the eradication of the Jewish state. Um, but I mentioned him, you know, it would come a lot better coming out of his mouth. It would sound a lot better if a contributor to Al Jazeera hadn't have been discovered last week to have been holding Jewish hostages in his home in Gaza yeah. and torturing them. Uh, one of a number of Al Jazeera journalists, as it happens, who have been found to be terrorists in recent years in Gaza. Um, I think it's absolutely despicable. Uh, that people pass themselves off as caring about the Palestinian peoples. And there are all of these uh, people working at Al Jazeera who are actually involved, not just in killing Jews, but in causing the war that has led to the suffering of Palestinians. It's absolute hypocrisy. And I'm very glad that the audience in Toronto realised that. And you can watch that full debate online. I would encourage you to do that. It is a... Uh... Very informative exercise. And you also made the excellent point that we actually have a real genocide happening in Sudan. Yes. And it seems to yes. be people aren't too interested in taking to the streets of Melbourne and Sydney and London and New York and elsewhere to protest against that. But they will protest uh, against Israel off after October 7. And if you're part of that mob, perhaps examine if you are indeed anti-Semitic. And... Um, I have to take you back to Keir Starmer here because uh, his response to the rise of anti-Semitism is to be seems to be to speak more about the dangers of Islamophobia. Here he is with uh, London Mayor Sadiq Khan doing just that. One of the things that is coming up over and over again um, is Islamophobia, and well, you can see the stats, you can see the numbers rising, particularly since October the seventh. Although we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that before October the 7th um, this was all heading in the right direction. It's been far too high for far too long. Clearly we need to just say over and over again um, Islamophobia is intolerable, uh, it can never ever be uh, justified and we have to continue with a zero tolerance approach. And I think there's more we can do in government. There's certainly stuff online which I think needs tackling much more robustly than it is at the moment. There you go, Douglas. Uh, we can look forward to more online censorship and campaigns to yeah. silence criticism that is uh, deemed Islamophobic under Labor. Yeah, I would just like to put to Keir Starmer uh, what he would do about something like that attack I just referred to in Toronto the other week, the other, last week. Uh, mm. If a Muslim uh, mob 
uh, shouting Allahu Akbar and shouting about the the dirty pigs and rats in the Jewish neighborhood. Um, uh, if anyone criticizes that, is it Islamophobic or not? Is it possible to call out mm. Islamic anti-Semitism? Uh, uh, or would it be Islamophobic? He and the other people pushing this have to be able to answer that question. Is it Islamophobic to notice that the marches that have defiled the centre of London week after week since October are predominantly, very largely Muslim, and that many of the Muslims on those marches are saying intolerably racist uh, things? Uh, is it Islamophobic to point that out? They're going to have to work this out, because if they don't, it's just going to be a huge and colossal uh, circular firing squad uh, for the coming years, metaphorically speaking, for now. And uh, uh, the lack of thought that people like Stam have put into this, the pandering to communities is, I think, a recipe for absolute disaster. You can stand up for the rights of all of your citizens to be able to live in peace. But that means standing up to hatred, wherever it comes from, of the most extreme kinds. And Keir Starmer would find it easy, I'm sure, like all of us, to stand up to any actual far-right extremism. Can he stand up to the Islamic extremists? We'll see. Now, before you go, overnight we saw the uh, climate cultists of Just Stop Oil attack Stonehenge. Their demented demands include Britain's uh, next government uh, committing legally to phasing out fossil fuels by 2030. Let's have a quick look. We can see their bystanders, women getting involved trying to stop that attack. So what sort of punishment is appropriate when political activists attack and vandalise a prehistoric monument? You know, Rita, the, the, this has been an escalation. I write about this in my Spectator column this week. There's been an escalation of this for some time now. Uh, all of these eco-loons thought that it was OK to throw soup uh, at a masterpiece by Van Gogh uh, uh, earlier this year, a horrible young woman uh, slashed and sprayed a graffiti over mm. uh, a portrait by the great Hungarian Jewish uh, painter Philip de Laszlo. Um, and there's been no punishment of her because she said she did it for Palestine. Yeah, right. Um, mm. And uh, now we see these eco-loons attacking one of Britain's most important archaeological sites. Um, it really tells you everything you need to know about a movement uh, when in order to save the planet, as they pretend they want to do, they destroy the planet. Um, I don't believe these people are driven by anything other than uh, narcissism, boredom, uh, extremism, and a couple of other such things. They are vicious narcissists and they're desperately seeking for some kind of cause and they are trashing our history and they're trashing our our holy places and our, our places of learning and culture, and they're getting away with it. And as far as I believe, I think they should all be thrown in prison for as long as they can be. And uh, any of these other people who want to try these tricks should go to prison following them. We need just the law to be enforced in one of these yeah. cases, and I think we would see a change in behaviour. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for your time this evening. Pleasure as always. Thank you.